Hi, I'm Randy Reed, editor of the Edison Report, and I am here in New York at the Mount Sinai Light and Health Research Center Founders Day, and I'm joined by Eric Swinson of Nietzsche. There you go. How are you doing, Randy? Welcome, Eric. It's nice to see you. Great to see you. Tell me why you're here. It's a, a new entry, new path for us to, to work with the Lighting Health Research Center. Uh, we're working with them on some new UV developments in the horticulture space for, for disinfection. So right, well, here to check out the new, new facilities. Tell our audience a little bit about where you're going with these UVs. Yeah. So Nietzsche has been doing UV LEDs for over 20 years no. uh, in the UV space. We've been manufacturing. With LEDs? Correct. Yep. UV LEDs for over 20 I years. I had no idea. Mostly UVA for, for curing. Okay. Uh, UVC for probably the last six years now. Um, really just starting to, to gain momentum, obviously, with, with the pandemic and, and for disinfection spaces. Uh, there's been a lot of talk and involvement in, with the IUVA in terms of for, for water and air disinfection, but the horticulture space, there's a lot of pull there for UV as well, not just for disinfection, but for growth purposes as well. So is that where you are playing right now, is in the horticulture? It's one of them. Definitely. Okay. Um, we're putting a lot of energy and resources into uh, water and air as well. Okay. Yep. And with water and air, that would be UVC? Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, with air, UVA has a space as well. Um, even visible has an opportunity for, uh, for, not for air, for surface. Okay. Uh, what kind of reception are you getting in the marketplace with UVC? And the reason I ask, a lot of people tell me that you still need the legacy products. In other words, the products that contain mercury. Yeah. They say you've yeah. got to have that yeah. because UVC LEDs don't have enough punch. What's your answer to that? It's the, the same discussion we were having in 2005 with white light. Okay. Don't, have the, don't have enough punch. Don't have enough punch. Well, we know that happened quickly, right? We know right. how quickly the... And I was one of the ones saying that in 2005, yep. by the way. I joined the industry in 2007, so I, I yeah. jumped in just a couple years after. But... For UVC development, when you compare just the light source of an LED to the lamp, mm -hmm. just the, the wall plug efficiency of the, the two of those, yes, it's much less efficiency. But if there's one thing we learned in the visible light space, it's not the light source that matters, it's the system, sure. right? It's the total system efficiency that matters. So that's one element of it. And what you can do with LEDs in terms of taking advantage of the form factor is enormous and, versus and, and a traditional lamp. Can you go into example with that? Can you give me an example well, of where that form function the comes into play? The LED is dramatically smaller, right? So you can make devices that can disinfect spaces significantly smaller with what uh, LHRC is doing and evaluating in the horticulture space with tractors, being able to make a disinfection device that can get affixed to a tractor and be able to address bacteria and growth on plants in the fields. So that'd be hard to do with a gigantic tube, right? Sure. So that's, that's one exciting space. But just with UVC LEDs as a whole, we know the game. We know we've been through it with white light. We know how to improve the efficiency, and it's going to happen quickly. So for mercury lamps, with what's happening with the Minamata Convention, there's exceptions that go out to 2027 for, for traditional uh, mercury-based lamps that... LED is going to address a lot of those. But I think in 2023, they're banned in Europe. Is Correct. That right? For fluorescent lamps. Fluorescent lamps. Yep. yep. Okay. Understood. Now, I just uh, came from a Nalmco convention, yep. and there was a lot of discussion about uh, certifying Nalmco members for installation on UV. What are your thoughts about that? I'm going to dance and dodge because I don't know a whole lot about okay. it yet. Yeah. Well, they're just having yeah. discussions. Okay. There's okay. no program yet that is being offered. I think they're working with IES and okay. a few other people to try to develop a program to ensure that the lighting maintenance contractor is properly trained. That, that's huge. I mean, when you talk about UV energy and UVC energy, it needs to be used responsibly. It needs to be used safely. So I think definite education, I don't know if to the extent of certifications, but um, it's something we need to clearly pay attention to. And when you talk about disinfection for air in occupied spaces, whether it's, it's just the, the general user in the space or the installer, it's something that needs to be paid attention to. So, you know, you, you mentioned about the white LEDs, kind of 2005, 2007, that yeah, time frame. Yeah. What do you think will be in 15 years from now with UV? Will it be everywhere, cleaning? It's, 
it's, I would say it's, you know, that's not going to be the only mechanism for cleaning, right? It, to me, it's a complementary tool. It's a complementary technology. It's not the end all be all. So I think it'll be an additional tool to help reduce some of the chemicals that we have to use. It will help make our buildings safer and the air we breathe cleaner. It's not going to be perfect. Nothing is perfect. But you don't have to be perfect to start, right? You have to start to be perfect. Sure, oh, I, I yeah. absolutely agree. Now, some critics will say that UVC kills everything, the good bugs and yeah. the bad bugs, yeah. and yeah. that the bad bugs will reproduce faster than the good bugs. What's your answer to that? Well, I'm not a biologist, so it's hard for me to dive deeply. Um, I'm a commercial guy now. Um, but it's something, that, again, that needs to be paid attention to, right? We right. don't want to fix one problem or help one problem but create another. So it's something that needs to be studied a little bit more and understood to make sure we are not causing new types of issues. What is uh, average life of UVC LEDs? Are we talking about 10,000 hours? They vary dramatically and that's a big issue right now. I think okay. you can find LED, UVC LEDs that are hundreds of hours. Um, you can find them that are 20, 30,000 hours at high temperatures, right? I mean it's we learned in the white space temperature hurts the LEDs, right? And you need to have good lifetime at elevated temperatures so that the designs sure. are properly heat synced and, and whatnot. And I feel like the UVC LED space, we've kind of forgotten that story a little bit. So there is a wide variety. And I think lots of people, the manufacturers are trying to improve the quality of the LEDs. That's certainly been a focus of Nietzsche is to maintain long lifetime, at least 10,000 hours R70 at elevated junction temperatures. And then... You, so now we're, so, excuse me, when I was in Phoenix, on the escalator, the black handrail right. had a sign and it said being cleaned with UVC. Now again, that's surface, that's not air. Mm -hmm. Okay, my question is, so I felt good about that and I grabbed hold of that escalator yes. because I was confident that it was clean. Yeah. Well, how do I know that that lamp that I can't see, of course, is, is it burned out? Is it on? Is it on? <laughs> yeah. How, how yeah. are you building yeah. safe safeguards into your products to ensure that they do that they are properly maintained? Well, I think that's a. And would you yeah. replace the driver? Would you replace the LEDs after ten thousand hours? Would you replace the whole fixture? How would that work? That incorporate. It's a great question that I think a lot of the the manufacturers of the end units are considering when they adopt sensors to monitor the the energy uh, of the light source itself. Now, now Nietzsche, we tend to be just the the LED manufacturer, so right. the people that we work with have to consider that because that's the worst thing you want is people thinking you're safe when in reality it's not right. on or it's it's not effective. Um, and for, let's say, upper air disinfection, okay, we know LEDs don't die catastrophically or they shouldn't. Um, right. So, right. okay, they degrade, but then you're, you're, all your math and your doses are, are now out of whack once you've reached 70%. You need more dose, right? So that's... That's the piece of the discussion right now that's happening. Um, I'm, a, I'm an old HID guy. Yeah. And they used to make uh, we had the HID lamp, and you would put two capacitors on it. <clears throat> and over time, one capacitor would turn off, and the second capacitor at a higher capacitance would kick on to raise that light level to keep those sports lights at 100%. Yeah. Can you do anything like that with LED? I think it's been done in the white space. I think as, as people have monitored um, lifetimes of the LEDs, and you can predict the degradation of the LED uh, given a certain temperature, and you can compensate for that with increased drive current. I think there are lighting products on the market that claim 100% okay. R70. Well, the only way to do that right. is to increase your energy in input, right? So but it can again, be done. Nietzsche is not into that. You're doing the Correct. Chips. Correct, we're the LED manufacturer. Leaving that to the others. Now okay. we'll work and help to reduce that resistance to help the adoption, right. um, but that's not our focus. So, um, <clears throat> Eric, Nietzsche is doing a little bit more outreach from what I understand. Can you tell our audience a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it, it's been something exciting uh, that myself and some of my colleagues, just getting more involved in the, in the industry, whether that's the lighting industry or the automotive industry or the UV industry, to, to get more of a vo voice of the industry, not just our customer base, but the end users, and to understand how we as a chip manufacturer can evolve our products to provide more. Uh, so I think that's been something that historically Nietzsche, being a Japanese manufacturer, 
sure. tend to stay secluded, tend to focus on research with just uh, Japanese universities. We're doing more outside of that. We've talked recently about the, some of the developments and research we've done with the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Right. Um, now here with LHRC, we're doing more outside of Japan, which is very exciting. Okay. Is OptiSolus one of your products? It is, yeah. So yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to rephrase that. Yeah. I saw the OptiSolus at Lighted Building. Can yeah. you tell our audience a little bit about that product? Yeah, OptiSolus, it's been on the market for a few years now, but hasn't gained a whole lot of um, adoption yet. But it, it's basically essentially 100 CRI LED. 100 CRI, that's essentially, right. Essentially, yep. So it's, it's near perfect. It, it's utilizing a little bit shorter wavelength than the okay. traditional 455 as the pump. Um, but it's it's geared for a niche market where people want perfect light. So it's uh, perfect for museums. No UV component that can degrade right. uh, any of the products. Right. So it, it's a beautiful light source. Uh, you know, again, I'm an old HID guy. Yeah. And I used to try to sell end users away from high pressure sodium because of that yellow color into the white brilliance of metal halide. And at your booth in Frankfurt, I saw LED mimicking high pressure sodium. Yes. yes. Tell our audience yeah. about why why are you doing yeah. that? Well, it's a beautiful look in a sense. When you go into cities and you get this romantic, nostalgic look of a lot of these HPS lamps, that's a look that, that LED has I don't want to say forced, but the industry's gotten away from, right? And and there's certain downsides clearly with HPS. It's it's hard to see under the CRI is very poor. But the energy efficient, I mean, they were efficient, right? They, right, they that's were why good. you did it. Um, and that's why they're still used. And, and it took some time for LEDs to reach at that color temperature. Making an 1800 Kelvin isn't, you know, that's not the innovation. But to make it efficient. But to make it efficient is. Okay. So it took time for us to achieve that. It took uh, improvements in the dye and wafer technology. So now we can do the energy uh, savings with LED. You can do it with 70 CRI and have right. better quality of light. You have long lifetime now. So that, to me, is a new space well, in the outdoor world. Your engineer was yeah. quite effective at the show because he had sodium next to it, and he yeah. had a rose. And he took the rose, and he put it under the 22 CRI yeah. of the high-pressure sodium and then the 70 CRI of your product, and it was beautiful. Yeah. So, that's awesome. Okay, well, Eric, uh, thank you for sitting down with me. It's always a pleasure. Great. Thanks, Randy.